Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Shaw Prize Lecture in Astronomy 2021 by Professor Victoria Caspi and Professor Chris Covileoto, the Shaw Laureate in Astronomy 2021. May I first invite Professor Li Huabai from the Department of Physics, our moderator today, to introduce the laureates. Professor Li, please. Good morning. Let me first uh, introduce Professor Chrysa Kovaliotou. She was born in Greece and educated in Europe. She got the bachelor's degrees in Greece, master's degrees in UK, and PhD from Germany. After serving as a faculty member of her alma mater for a few years, she moved to NASA 1991 and joined the gamma ray astrophysics team, where she made the first confirmed detection of magnetars. And because of this discovery and later research, she got a long series of awards. And here I can only introduce some examples. Like in 2002, the Descartes Prize, which is the EU Prize for Science and Technology, Bruno Rossi Prize, the US Prize for uh, High Energy Astrophysics, the NASA Space Act Award, and the Danny Heinemann Prize for Astrophysics, another US award. And in 2012, she got selected by the Time Magazine as the 25 most influential people in space research. 2015, she moved to uh, George Washington University and served as the chair of the Department of Physics. As we all know, this year, she got awarded the Shaw Prize. And let us learn more about her research from her lecture. I am grateful to the Shaw Prize Foundation and its leader, Sarah Run Run Shaw, and to my colleagues who nominated me for the 2021 Shaw Prize in Astronomy. I am thankful and indebted to my colleagues who traveled with me the long path of research to discovery during the 40-some years of my career. We, as astronomers, have gone a long way from the first visual star observers thousands of years ago to the extremely complex and sophisticated missions of today. Yet, we are still finding ourselves pursuing the same enduring quests. How does the universe work? Probe the origin and destiny of our universe. How did we get here? Explore the origin and the evolution of galaxies, stars, and planets. And a question that I know many humans on the planet have asked very often. Are we alone? Discover and study planets around other stars and explore whether they could harbor life. How can we do all that? We need the astronomical messengers. The most common and abundant of all of them are photons, the electromagnetic spectrum. We go from the very high energy photons, the gamma rays, to the very low energy photons, the radio waves. Except besides this messenger, we have cosmic rays, gravitational waves, and neutrinos. I am not going to talk about the last three because I'm only going to discuss electromagnetic waves. Photons, the most abundant messengers in the universe. What do we learn from photons? From each photon, we can measure its direction. Where did it come from in space? its arrival time, when was it recorded on the detector that caught it, energy, and polarization, which is related to the plane of oscillation of the transverse electromagnetic wave as it moves in space. I am going to tell you about high energy photons, gamma rays and x-rays. This is where most of my work has been done. And I'm going to talk to you about magnetars, 
extremes of the high energy universe. Magnetars are transient events and have properties that can be put in this qualitative diagram which shows the scale of variability in the high energy transient phenomena in our universe from very fast variability to the actual left side of this diagram to much slower variability from milliseconds to years. Magnetars emit bursts that are extremely short, 100 to 200 milliseconds long. So their place in this is pretty close to the very short phenomena. A very short description of magnetars is given here. They are slowly rotating, magnetically powered neutron stars with extreme magnetic fields up to 10 to the 15 Gauss. They are persistent and transient X-ray sources which occasionally enter into active outbursts and emit from tens to several hundreds, even thousands of hard X-ray and soft gamma ray bursts. Only three out of the almost 28 known sources have emitted a very rare event called a giant flare, one each. All except two reside in our galaxy. The other two are in two satellite galaxies to our own, the large and the small Magellanic Cloud. There is no evidence that they belong in a binary system. They are quite a loner. And they have been detected in X-rays, infrared, optical, and radio. When I talk about extremes, I want to put it in context with the other objects in our galaxy and in our everyday life that have magnetic fields. Our galaxy has a magnetic field of one over a million Gauss two over a million Gauss. In the planet, Jupiter has a thousand Gauss, which is the unit for the magnetic field, uh, and the Earth has 0.6 Gauss. The Sun, our Sun, has an ordered field of about five Gauss, but if you look at its sunspots, it goes up to a thousand. The common refrigerator magnet has a hundred Gauss Mag magnetism, which basically beats the Earth and a lot of the other planets. The average magnetic resonance imaging field is 15,000 Gauss, and the strongest sustained laboratory fields are 4.5 times 10 to the 5, almost a million Gauss. And the strongest man-made field is 10 million Gauss. The bulk of radio pulsars <coughs> is, has a magnetism of 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 Gauss. And then come magnetars with 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 Gauss, and sometimes maybe even more. So, the magnetar discovery, where it all began, on March 5th, 1979. That is when a flaring X-ray pulsar from Dorado was recorded to emit a very bright burst. It was originally assigned to the gamma ray burst family. But there were some properties for this particular burst, which is actually depicted here. This is the light curve, which basically shows the evolution of the arriving photons in time, in intensity here or rather in count rate. So this light curve, as we call it, was periodic. It was very close to periodic. And that indicated that the emitting source was a neutron star and not a black hole. Even more interestingly, very, very soon after, this source emitted more bursts from the same direction, from the same source which completely 
contradicted the concept of a gamma ray burst origin because gamma ray bursts are catastrophic phenomena, so they cannot emit repeated bursts. There was a lot of discussion in the community at that time if that were an extremely separate phenomenon. And indeed, in after a lot of discussion and with the help of nature, we detected two more events that actually had exactly the same behavior, namely repeating soft X-ray bursts, and it became obvious that we were looking at a new phenomenon associated with neutron stars instead of black holes. For lack of better imagination, we named these sources soft gamma repeaters, SGRs. And that was in 1987. In 1995, Anomalous X-ray pulsars were also identified as a small set of X-ray pulsars with common properties, setting them aside from the rest of the X-ray pulsar population. I will not talk about anomalous X-ray pulsars because my friend and colleague Vicky Caspi, who shares the show prize with me, will talk about it. In 1987, as I mentioned, these two sources were identified as SGRs, and we published three papers because we were three groups and each group had a lot of things to say about this new population of objects. In 1995, again, two theorists, Rob Duncan and Chris Thompson, came up with the concept of magnetars. They said that they constitute a class of neutron stars distinct from pulsars, and they associated these objects with soft gamma repeaters, anomalous X-ray pulsars, and classical gamma ray bursts. Now, this is the theory before the discovery. In 1998 came the discovery with measuring the actual magnetic field of one of these objects. It is one of the few times I'm aware of that the theory precedes the actual observation and the discovery. So, magnetars are neutron stars, they pulsate, and as well they do the radio pulsars. That, what is the difference between the bulk of the population of pulsars and magnetars, who, which are definitely much rarer than uh, radio pulsars, as far as we know, or as far as we can observe, I should say. The difference is that radio pulsars keep their energy and emission much longer than magnetars. Magnetars are 10,000 years of age. They're practically unobservable in X-rays, while radio pulsars go up to 10 million years, and they can still be observable. Above 10 million years, they're remnants as well. So what is the magnetar conjecture? The magnetar conjecture states that the neutron star is powered by its super strong magnetic field, which is 10 to the 14 to the 15 Gauss. How do you create these fields? It requires the collapse of a fast rotating star spinning at one to three millisecond period with very high convection rates, which is called the magnetic Reynolds number, uh, which basically is uh, a combination of these two uh, properties. Ideal efficiency can generate 10 to the 16 Gauss. However, we cannot go beyond 10 to the 18 Gauss because the magnetic energy has to be less than the gravitational binding energy of the neutron star. So, in other words, if it goes above 10 to the 18, the neutron star will fall apart. In a picture, Having a neutron star, how to make a magnetar, you have a hot newborn star which churns and mixes. There is internal convection which brings the hot matter in the top and then cools off and goes down to the bottom and reheats. And at the same time, while the convection happens, there is a lot of fast rotation which then bunches all the magnetic field lines and increases the magnetic field significantly. If it's spinning faster than 200 revolutions per second, the dynamo action takes over and builds the magnetic field very high. 
So this is the theory. How do we know that indeed there are such high magnetic fields? By using the timing properties of the sources. We use the quiescent pulsed X-ray emission of the source to calculate the mean surface dipole field using this formula, which depends on the period of the source and the period derivative, or a measure, we call it P dot, a measure of how fast the period changes, the rate of uh, increase or uh, decline of the period. And also we can measure the um, spin-down age of these sources by using, again, the two parameters. The values of the p-dot are typically higher in soft gamma repeaters, resulting in b-fields ranging between 6 to 8, 10 to the 14, and spin-down ages of 1 to 2,000 years. In contrast, the AXPs have smaller p-dots, corresponding to b-fields of the order of 6 to 7, 0.6 to 7, 10 to the 14, and characteristic ages that go beyond 200,000 years. The first two sources where we were able to measure these timing properties were SGR 1806-20 and SGR 1900 plus 14. The magnetic fields we were measuring were very similar, 8, 7, 6 to 8 times 10 to the 14 Gauss. In general now, in magnetars have long spin periods, which is 2 to 12 seconds, rapid spin downs, 0.5 times 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 13 seconds per second, and magnetic fields between 1 and 10 times 10 to the 15 Gauss, which is the mean surface dipole field. However, we have three sources that do not deserve to be part of this club because they have much less magnetic field strengths. We do not know why, but I'm sure we'll find other peculiarities in this uh, club. And the spin down uh, ages are 2 to 220 kilo years. Magnetars have two states in general, quiescent and active. During their active state, several hundreds of bursts can be detected. We call those burst storms or forests of bursts. Only four sources have uh, exhibited that behavior. We have three sources which each emitted a giant flare, and a few sources, three, that emitted few tens of bursts. Eleven sources have emitted less than ten bursts, and there's five sources which we have not actually found bursts from. Five candidate magnetars are sources that actually have only been detected by their burst emission and not by their location and the, and the detection of their X-ray um, emission. Magnetar outbursts have a specific way of declining. In other words, the source, when it is non-active, probably is not even visible. And then when it becomes active, the luminosity of the source increases very high. And it takes about three years or so to go down to maybe its quiescent state. In other words, the before and after is if you know where the source is after you detected it, you can go back in archival observations and find out whether it was there at that time. And in this case, then it was, but when it wasn't. And here, when the actual source became active, you can see very clearly that there is an additional source next to uh, Sagittarius so A. Magnetar bursts range uh, in th and classify into three categories. The giant flares, as I mentioned earlier, only three have been detected in 40 years. The intermediate flares or bursts, which appear usually during the storms of bursts, and the working horse of the bursts, which is the short bursts that last point 
1 to 0.25 seconds unpredictable onset of activity. Thousands of bursts of this kind have been detected. The light curves of these bursts are here, and they are all very different. There is a single peak. Again, this is the count rate or the counts we detect in time, so the evolution of this in time. Uh, there is a precursor, which is a small blip here, which preceded the main outburst. There is one with a lot of structure, multi-peaked, and there is one that was so bright that it saturated the detector. As a result, we went back to zero when it wasn't recording, and then back to the actual recording when uh, the detector was enabled again. The brightest observed gamma ray transients from magnetars are the giant flares. This is one of the most spectacular of them. It's not a dinosaur, it's a giant flare, and it's basically uh, showing this um, decline here because the satellite triggered on the actual event, the first part, and it was located in the sky, and then the whole satellite turned towards the right direction in order to measure, so it lost during the switching uh, some of the photons. The burst storm during January 2009 recorded 450 bursts in 24 hours. These are really what we call storms. What happens in this flux, in the persistent flux of the source, during a burst storm. The frequency or the period changes significantly as an effect of the storm. And you can see that it was actually moving on a specific curve and then it went even less. It became steeper. So it does change the effect of period, the period of the source. And also it changes the profile. Here is the profile of the pulse before the giant flare in this case. And now after the giant flare was emitted, you see that there is a very sinusoidal and very normal pulse. Where are the magnetars? They are in our galaxy. There's about 26 sources to date and there's two of satellite galaxies of our galaxy. The spectral information of the persistent X-ray emission is given here, and what we can see is the luminosity, what we can actually calculate is the luminosity of the source, 10 to the 32, 10 to the 36 ergs, and the X-ray spectrum, which tells you what exactly is the content of the uh, photons that arrive in our detector from the source. We model this and we find that magnetars have two component model, one black body, a thermal component and one power low with temperature of 0.3 kV for the black body and spectral index 3.5 for the power low. The persistent pulsed emission also was detected in the 20 to 150 kV range in some sources. So why is that so? The magnetar X-ray emission origin, origin is the twisted magnetosphere, which supports a very large electrical current causing a significant optical depth. The thermal emission from the hot neutron star surface will undergo resonant cyclotron scattering in the magnetosphere and the net luminosity is Comptonized X-ray photons, which means that we are getting a lot of the electron energy into the photon energy. And therefore, we can see that the pulsed emission spectroscopy goes up to much higher values than the actual persistent emission of the source. What I need to show here is the actual small burst comparison between it, from magnetars to the giant flare. What you see is that the uh, flux of the giant flare is at least two orders of magnitude higher than the flux of the small bursts. What is a magnetar X-ray burst emission mechanism? 
As I mentioned earlier, the extreme magnetic field decay is the source of power for X-ray emission. And this is a Scientific American series of snapshots, not real, just uh, um, man-made, so to speak. And you can see that these are the magnetic field lines. There is the neutron star. So most of the time, the magnetar is quiet, but the magnetic stresses are slowly building up and at some point, the solid crust is stretched beyond its limit. In other words, it, the, whole, the whole crust of the neutron star is under a lot of torque and it cracks. And when it cracks, it creates a star quake. A surging electric current is the outcome of that and the case leaving behind a fireball. The fireball cools by releasing X-rays from its surface and it evaporates in minutes or less. These giant flares are something else. It's not due to a star quake. It's due to another phenomenon that we call magnetic field line reconnection. The huge amounts of energy released during the giant flares of the order of the total rotational energy of the source requires a catastrophic rearrangement, we call that field line reconnection, of the external magnetic field. The enormous sudden energy release in relativistic outflow produces a trapped fireball that is modulated at the star's rotational period, and that's the tail that we watched before. The initial spike strength reflects the physics of the reconnection site, while the tail strength reflects the ability of the field to trap particles. The tail energies are therefore similar in all three flares, while the spike energy of the December 2004 flare <clears throat> was a factor of a hundred higher than in the other two. A very important diagram for all pulsars is what we call the PP dot diagram. You see the uh, P dot here and the P here the period of the source and the breaking rate or the change of the period um, axis. There's different kinds of pulsars in here. There's millisecond pulsars, there's rotationally powered pulsars, and then there is the magnetar era. They have their own corner up here where everything is a lot extreme. High periods, high magnetic fields, high P dots. There is some outliers, as I mentioned. We do not understand that, but may, it may be that slowly this whole gap will fill. When you actually zoom into the magnetar area, you get a much uh, detailed, a much more detailed uh, view of where the magnetars are lying. All the sources at the upper corner are magnetars. The ones that are filled red are radio sources, which means these are magnetars emitting in the radio, and there are not many, because only five out of 20 some. And then this is a brand new magnetar that showed up last year, this year, and there's the rest of the magnetars with their nicknames. This year, this year, last couple of years, or maybe more, uh, there is a new mystery that is making us work hard, the fast radio bursts. These are radio bursts that are actually very short, millisecond short. They are coming from galaxies far away, and their luminosities are orders of magnitude higher than any known short radio transient. In other words, we had never encountered those before, and we did not really know very well what their origin is. However, some of these sources have been observed to repeat, which put together a model, or several actually, that magnetars are in the source of, are the source of this um, phenomenon, the fast radio bursts. So magnetars have been now detected or assumed that belong in radio bursts as well, fast radio bursts. And that cleansed it because we had last year one of the soft gamma repeaters 
emitting an X-ray burst during an activation associated with a fast radio burst. In other words, they were almost simultaneous, contemporaneous, I should say, but very close to each other. So there is a direct association in our own galaxy between fast radio bursts and magnetars with one event. We are waiting to see more events, but that event already has made a huge impact in our understanding. So, as a summary, magnetars are probes of conditions inaccessible on Earth. Strong gravity, ultra-nuclear densities, and the strongest magnetic fields in the universe, over 100 trillion times that of the Sun, providing tests of general relativity and quantum electrodynamics. Magnetars are invoked as the end products of multiple key transient phenomena, such as long and short gamma ray bursts, superluminous supernova, and fast radio bursts. Thank you. Our second lecture will be given by Professor Victoria Caspi. She was born in the US and moved to Canada when she was very young. And she got a bachelor degrees from Canada, uh, McGill University, and later the PhD from Princeton University. Afterwards, she got the most prestigious postdoctoral uh, fellow in astronomy, the Hubble Fellowship, with which he worked in JPL and MIT. And in 1997, she became the assistant professor in MIT. Two years later, she moved on to McGill University and became associate professor and later promoted to professor there. From where she showed that the uh, numberless X-ray pulsars are also magnetars. And this discovery, along with later research, won her a long series of awards. Again, I can only give you some examples here, including the Hertzberg uh, Medal, which is a Canadian award for physicists. The Rutherford Memorial Medal, another Canadian award for physics and chemistry. Um, in 2016, she won the Gerhard Herzberg Canada Gold Medal, which is considered the top award of science and engineering in Canada. And Professor Caspi is the first female awardee of this medal. And two years ago, she got selected by the Nature magazine as the 10 most influential scientists of the year. Earlier this year, before the short prize, she won the Bacarian Medals from UK. Well, let's enjoy her lecture. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very proud and honored to be uh, here telling you about magnetars and anomalous X-ray pulsars following uh, Krista Kovalietu's lecture. Uh, a little bit about my background because it is relevant to understanding how I came to be involved in the whole magnetar story. I actually did my PhD in radio astronomy, a very different field. I was uh, co-supervised by Nobel laureate Joseph Taylor and uh, Dick Manchester at the Australia Telescope National Facility. And my PhD project was uh, to search for and time radio pulsars. So here we're talking about radio astronomy. These are the sorts of telescopes that I used. In fact, they're the exact telescopes that I used. Uh, for my PhD, the Parkes Telescope in Australia and the Arecibo Telescope, unfortunately, no longer uh, functioning in uh, Puerto Rico. So very large, large apertures, ground-based, uh, collecting radio waves. This is uh, what, we, what we did. And what we were studying was radio pulsars, that is, rapidly rotating, uh, highly magnetized neutron stars that emit a beam of light from their magnetic poles, and uh, that magnetic pole is not aligned with the spin axis. So it's rotating, but on the other hand, the, the beam is rotating, and, and we see one flash each time that magnetic beam crosses our line of sight, kind of like a lighthouse. So these, these, this is how, how, at least an artist's concept of what a, of a radio pulsar looks like, but how do scientists actually see it? How do, how do astronomers see it? We, what we really detect are 
uh, radio pulses. So uh, we take the data from the radio telescope, digitize it, record it to disk, and then when we put it into the computer, we see radio intensity as a function of time. And that's what you're seeing here, that how, how strong the radio emission is as a function of time. And each of these is one rotation of a neutron star. This is actual radio pulsar data. And the, the most important characteristic here is the time between the pulses. That's telling us how fast the neutron star is rotating. Because each time it rotates, that's, it, you see one, one pulse. So that's, we, we refer to that as the pulse period. And I said my PhD was on pulsar timing. And what that means is to uh, predict, to actually measure the period of the pulsar really, really well. And you can do that by, you know, you measure it, uh, you think, oh, you can, there's a lot of noise here. Sometimes the pulses are a little different, so you might think it's not a very precise science. But in fact, it's an incredibly precise science uh, because on average, the pulses come extremely regularly. So that if you measure the average pulse period here, you can then predict for the next week when any one pulse will come. Uh, and you can even do this, if you, if you refine the method, you can predict for the next month or the, even, the next six, even the next year, you can, once you measure the period really precisely, you can predict when the next pulse will come. And if it comes a little early, then you, can, you know your period was a little off, it comes a little late, your period was, was a little too short. And, and we measure pulse periods really precisely. That's called pulsar timing. And by predicting the exact time of arrival of a pulse some often, somewhere off in the future, we refer to that as phase coherent timing, meaning we know the phase when that, when that pulse is going to come. And, and we can do that really, really well. So phase coherent timing, this is what I did for my PhD. You keep track of every single pulse over weeks, months, or years. There's no ambiguity, even years off, as to exactly what pulse you're refer you, you've predicted. And you can do this because neutron stars are incredibly stable rotators. They're, huge amounts of inertia crushed into a very small region. So it's something 40% more mass than that of the sun crushed into a radius uh, of about 10, 10 or 15 kilometers. That's a huge amount of inertia. These things, once they start rotating, they rotate uh, like flywheels. It's very hard to stop them. So they're very, very precise clocks. And in fact, some radio pulsars have their period measured to one part in 10 to the 14 so that they're actually comparable to the world's best atomic time standards. Uh, and then you can imagine, once you have a perfect clock like that in the cosmos, you can use radio pulsars for a whole variety of uh, applications. You can measure when they're in binary systems using the Doppler shift of their period. Uh, here's actually a, a, bi a, a binary pulsar here. You can see this is the period as a function of time. Each point here is one, one day when we measure the period with the error bar included. So you see it's very easy to see that this, the period is changing, and that's because the pulsar is orbiting another star in this case. So you can do all sorts of wonderful things with, with phase coherent timing, and that's, that's what I did. Now, so just a word or two about how neutron stars are formed, where they come from. They're the remnants of massive stars that have burned through all their nuclear fuel in their core. And due to the crushing pull of inward pull of gravity, their cores implode. Uh, that's the, here it's called the red giant phase. The core implodes and uh, a neutron star can form under just the right circumstances. And the outer regions of the star get sent careening into interstellar space. And you get a neutron star surrounded by a supernova remnant, this whole process called a supernova. And we see these all over, uh, all over the sky. In fact, one of the most famous ones is the Crab Nebula, a remnant of a supernova that we know happened in the year 1054 AD. And uh, in this case, the neutron star is very close to the center of this supernova remnant. And uh, in fact, it is all, it's, it's a neutron star that is also a radio pulsar. Here you can see uh, in, in the grayscale a zoom in of the inner regions of the Crab Nebula. And here's really rapid photography. This whole time sequence lasts just 33 thousandths of a second, 33 milliseconds. And 
And when you zoom into the center of the Crab Nebula and you, you photograph it really fast like this, what you see is one star that's always on, and that's a, a boring <laughs> conventional star that's just in the foreground or the background, nothing to do with the supernova around it. But another star there turns on and then turns off and turns on and turns off. And that is the flashing. That's the uh, rotation of the neutron star that you're seeing. In the Crab Nebula, this one rotates 30 times every second. So young pulsars, not long after they're born, tend to rotate quite fast. That's, that's important. Um, now back to magnetars, and you've seen this plot before in, in Chris's lecture. The story really starts with magnetars in, on March 5th, 1979, when there was a huge soft gamma ray burst uh, from the direction of the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, various solar system probes uh, and orbiting satellites detected this huge explosion. That's this huge burst here. This is now counts in gamma rays as a function of time. And what was amazing is first, it, it saturated many of the detectors. That's why there's a little arrow here. Uh, but once it started to, to relax, once the gamma rays start, disappeared, afterward there came these pulsations every eight seconds. So pulsations, that's that's familiar, we, we know things that, that pulsate, I just talked about radio pulsars, but this is in the gamma rays, so that was something uh, truly remarkable. Uh, and the picture that we know now, as you heard from Chris, is that these are neutron stars, like radio pulsars, except hugely magnetized, with magnetic fields 10, well, more like 100 to 1,000 times greater than that of a conventional radio pulsar, that's a magnetar, and when you have those kind of magnetic field strengths, the neutron star, we believe, becomes unstable to these huge explosions, these, these bursts. Uh, so that March 5th event, with the huge gamma ray burst followed by the eight second pulsations, was then localized to be within a supernova remnant in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And so that was quite interesting, because here you had something that pulsated, albeit slowly, compared to, say, the crab pulsar that pulsates every you know, 30 times per second here, once every eight seconds, something slow, but in a supernova remnant. So that sounds a little bit like a neutron star, but a strange kind of neutron star. Conventional young neutron stars in supernova remnants rotate much more rapidly. So that was a bit of a puzzle. And then later, in, uh, later another source, uh, another gamma ray burst, soft gamma ray burst source went off, and you heard this in Chris's lecture. Uh, and then in the 1980s, the third one went off. And these came to be known as soft gamma repeaters because many bursts were seen from them uh, from the same sources. And then there was a seminal series of papers by Chris Thompson and Rob Duncan that interpreted these observations in terms of the magnetar model, this highly magnetized neutron star model, and made interesting predictions about how these stars should be rotating. So the idea was the event found in a supernova remnant with pulsations, that, that suggests a neutron star. The long period though, why eight seconds? There, the interpretation was it was due to a high magnetic field which braked the star, caused magnetic braking to slow it down in a very short time. So it's rapid spin down was predicted by the magnetar model. And uh, this high magnetic field that you need to break the neutron star in the time it takes for the super, in the time it takes before a supernova remnant dissipates, a short time, uh, would provide also the power for the gamma ray bursts. It's a beautiful prediction and a beautiful model, and it predicted that these sources should be spinning down, should be getting slower with time because they're releasing so much energy, that rotation should, should get longer and longer and longer. And that's exactly what Chris Akovlietu uh, confirmed uh, for this source. And it was a beautiful confirmation of magnetar model. But meanwhile, a totally different class or apparently different class of X-ray sources in the sky was causing uh, a little bit of puzzlement in the community. This was, they were known as the anomalous X-ray pulsars. Uh, this was a class of X-ray pulsars with few second periods. Uh, steady pulsations, steady X-ray pulsations. They didn't show any kind of bursting, or they certainly weren't known to, 
to emit any kinds of bursts, and they were long believed to be accreting sources, meaning that the power source of their X-rays was matter falling onto them, from, probably from a, some sort of binary companion star, or perhaps from some sort of disk. Uh, nobody quite knew the source of the matter, but they were widely believed to be accreting sources, uh, because you needed something to power the, the X-rays. And rotation power, the way that the crab pulsar is, uh, produces its emission, just fails by orders of magnitude. You needed something to produce those X-rays. And so uh, here's a few papers from the literature on the nature of the six-second, they referred to them as six-second X-ray pulsars. They were slow X-ray pulsars, and you can see uh, they propose, uh, these, these were very prominent, uh, actually, you know, brilliant astrophysicists at the time, but this was the convention, the, the conventional belief was that these were accreting from a disk, these sources. And, and here's another similar paper from a, a other uh, really um, amazing people in the field who went on to do fantastic things, but, but really the commonly held belief was that they were accreting binaries or, or something accreting. And um, I was a postdoc at the California Institute of Technology and I went to a lunchtime talk around this time uh, by this professor Tom Prince and I remember him talking about the anomalous X-ray pulsars very animatedly, it was a big puzzle, and he talked entirely in terms of accretion theory and why no model involving accretion could explain all of their properties. It was a really excellent talk, and I just remember leaving it puzzled and thinking, wow, this is so cool. I, I, I didn't know much about X-ray astronomy. I had been entirely in radio astronomy, but here was an interesting puzzle. We didn't understand them. And people kept looking for binary companions and having the, the constraints on binarity were getting really, really tight, and it was just a, a, a puzzle. Um, and then I don't remember exactly when I read this paper. It was around this time I was reading about magnetars, and I, I saw that Thompson and Duncan mentioned the anomalous X-ray pulsars in one of their key seminal papers about magnetars. And they suggested that these could also be magnetars. They were emitting X-rays, and they were slowly pulsating, just like some of the soft gamma repeaters had been seen to do, but of course it, it was puzzling because the anomalous X-ray pulsars didn't burst or anything crazy like that. Uh, so nobody, this was a, interesting, and, and around the same time there was another clue that I remember hearing about at a conference that really got me thinking along these lines, and that was the discovery of a 12-second X-ray pulsar in the center of the supernova remnant Cas 73 is an X-ray image of this remnant, you can see the pulsar is really bright. That was also quite puzzling because it, it seemed like a really slow pulsar to have in the center of a supernova remnant. Um, and the authors argued perhaps it has a high magnetic field, and that was later confirmed by them by measuring uh, a high spin down rate, meaning it must have been born with a high magnetic field. It had magnetic braking, slowed it down to the very long 12 second period in a, in a very uh, short amount of time before the supernova remnant had a chance to to dissipate into the interstellar medium. So all these things together made me think about those anomalous X-ray pulsars that perhaps they were steady rotators, so perhaps they had magnetic, magnetar strength magnetic fields, and yet were more steady rotators, not like the soft gamma repeaters that were volatile and exploding and doing all sorts of amazing things. Maybe these were quiet kind of magnetars, and maybe if I apply the techniques of phase coherent timing that I had used as a PhD student in radio astronomy into the X-ray domain, maybe that would prove that, ah, yes, they're extremely stable. We can predict their phase over months to years. That would be a lot of evidence against accretion because accreting sources are, tend to be extremely noisy from a rotational point of view. So the idea was um, I was moving to MIT as a faculty member and uh, there was this new mission called the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer. This is an artist's picture of it. It was about to be launched, or, or it had recently, very recently been launched with the PI principal investigator, Gene Swank. And I, the idea was to use RXTE to time anomalous X-ray pulsars and see how steady they were. I didn't know too much about XTE, so I uh, called up my friend at MIT, Deepto Chakrabarty. I wrote the science proposal, he helped me with all the technical work, and it was very demanding of resources, because to do phase coherent timing, you need the satellite to point at very specific relative times uh, at the source. You need to, 
to watch it to be able to monitor its phase. Uh, and yet they accepted the proposal, which, which was a shock. And we started to observe anomalous X-ray pulsars uh, monthly or weekly, depending on the source, whatever it took to maintain phase coherence and, and count every single pulse. Uh, and we started to do that in 1998 using really brief snapshots. Um, and we were able to do it. So it turned out that the neutron stars, the AXPs, were stable enough that we could predict their phases, their rotational phases, uh, for many, many months. And this, it worked. So it said, ah, they're probably, to me already, they were not accretors. Uh, this is what I wrote in paper. Not everybody believed me at the time. Um, we also started discovering glitches, that is, sudden increases in the rotation rate of these objects, something that is seen ubiquitously in radio pulsars, like the crab pulsar, in fact, sudden rotational rate increases. Uh, and so that was another smoking gun that this was an isolated, non-accreting star, because radio pulsars, generally speaking, are isolated and, uh, and exhibit the, exactly these phenomena. So this convinced certainly me and a few other people that they were magnetars. Uh, but we continued to monitor them. Uh, even though, in my mind, ah, they seem, sure seem like quiet magnetars. But we continued to monitor them. We thought, well, maybe if it is a quiet magnetar, maybe one day it'll explode like all the soft gamma repeaters. So we kept monitoring, and sure enough, um, in the year 2000, I moved to McGill University in Montreal, and we started looking for um, bursts in some of our AXP data. We had so much data from all the phase coherent timing that we could do this. It was actually Pete Woods who suggested at a conference, have you ever looked for bursts in your data? And my graduate student, Fotis Gavril, uh, and I said, oh, actually, it's a great idea. And we went back to Montreal and we started looking. And Fotis, uh, it didn't take long. We had to figure out how to look for bursts. We didn't know how to do that. But soon enough, in 2001, we discovered two kind of small bursts from the direction of one AXP. And it was actually, an AXP, I remember, one of the, the noisiest ones, the ones that we had the most trouble doing phase coherent timing on. And I thought, ah, noisy, maybe it's the most like an SGR. Uh, maybe that's why it's bursting. But it was, the bursts were not all that, there's, yeah, that's Fotis. The bursts were not all that strong. This is actually the data from XTE where you can see the first burst. This is shown at different time resolutions. It was. It was a tiny, kind of puny burst compared to the SGR. So we really scratched our heads over it for a long time. We wondered, are there any other astrophysical objects that can make bursts like this? They're, they're quite short. They, they lasted just a, you know, 100 milliseconds, something like that. So we read the literature. We looked. We couldn't find any other source. And we went ahead and we published it in Nature. Uh, they, the Nature accepted our paper. But there was always that little nervousness in the back of my mind. Are we sure it's? the same source because XTE doesn't really, didn't really focus. You couldn't be guaranteed it, wasn't, it was the same source that, of, of the pulsations. So it was always a little worry, but it wasn't long after we published it that the, the, that the big event happened. So on June 18th, 2002, during XTE monitoring observations of a different AXP, in fact, the most stable one, the one that I would have least expected to show a massive outburst, uh, we saw this huge burst of X-rays. This is now several orbits of XTE. This is now uh, many hours. And you can see each one of these spikes is another huge X-ray burst from the source. And I remember Jean Swank herself called me on the phone. It was the first time I'd made a scientific discovery by telephone. And she said, Vicky, 1E2259 plus 586 is bursting. What do you want us to do? It's setting off alarms on the satellite. And I said, keep observing it. And that's why we got multiple orbits, even though normally we would have only gotten one orbit. Uh, so this, in that phone call, I knew that our nature paper was right, that AXPs are magnetars. They, it, it, was, it was a, a eureka moment. It's so rare in, in science. Um, another thing that was particularly memorable about this moment is that I was nine months pregnant. And uh, the word burst meant something very different to me at the time. Uh, and this it happened on June 18th, and my daughter, uh, Julia, was born on July 2nd. So it was just a couple of weeks, and I had enough time to, to get all the uh, other missions, uh, XMM looking at it and getting a few other uh, telescopes staring at it uh, before I went into labor. Uh, <laughs> and that's Julia, and this is Julia today. 
She's now 19. Um, and so we published this, uh, this time in the Astrophysical Journal, a major soft gamma repeater-like outburst, and it also had a rotational glitch, by the way. And I, I love this title, uh, in the no longer so anomalous uh, X-ray uh, pulsar 182259 plus 586. Uh, I was, wasn't sure the journal editor would allow us to include that, that name, but they did, and I'm, I'm very happy they did. Um, so my research group continued to monitor AXPs really for the next 15 years. And, and following that first exciting outburst, we detected many others, uh, us and other groups around the world started detecting these. And we realized it truly was a generic phenomenon to the anomalous X-ray pulsars. Uh, we used all sorts of different X-ray telescopes, Chandra, New Star, Swift, uh, the XMM Newton, uh, and we showed that AXPs have outbursts. We characterized the outbursts, compared them to SGRs. They're a little different, but as we studied more and more and more, it became clear that AXPs and SGRs really were one and the same. Uh, the line between them became quite blurred. Some AXPs were SGR-like, some SGRs were XP-like. And today we just refer to the whole lot of them as, as magnetars. Um, now, I... Long, about 15 years of studying them, I really felt I had contributed as much as I could to the, the field. I, a lot of people were doing fantastic work, and I, I started looking for something a little different to work on. And, and right around that time, um, I switched back to radio astronomy because of this novel phenomenon, very, another totally puzzling phenomenon called fast radio bursts got published by uh, Lorimer et al. reported this, rad now this is a radio burst, this is time on the x-axis, and radio frequency on the y-axis. And you can see this telltale sweep. As we've always seen from galactic radio pulsars, uh, the high, high radio frequencies arrive before low radio frequencies due to dispersion in interstellar plasma. This sweep, if you correct for it later in software, which is what we do, um, this is what the inset is. You sum up over all radio frequencies and you align the pulse, you see the single burst and then nothing abs uh, after that. And that, this was a fast, the first fast radio burst. And what was amazing is that the degree of dispersion here, the amount of dispersion implied that this source had to have come from far, far outside the Milky Way galaxy. And that was a real shock, almost from cosmological distances. All the radio pulsars we had studied over the years were pretty much all in our galaxy or in neighboring satellite galaxies, not from huge, uh, intergalactic cosmological distances. Uh, so we knew this had to be intrinsically very, very bright, or, or Lorimer at all when they published it, uh, they knew it had to be intrinsically very, very bright and, and something truly novel in the universe. Uh, and, but they had, didn't know what it was, a mystery. And you know, this is a shot prize because of magnetar, so why am I talking about fast radio bursts? You'll understand in a moment. Um, Around the same time that fast radio bursts were coming to be recognized as an uh, astrophysical phenomenon, uh, Canadian cosmologists were designing and building a novel kind of radio telescope called CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. It doesn't look like the other radio telescopes I showed you earlier. It has a different design. These are reflectors, and it's a very large structure. These are cylindrical paraboloids. Uh, that are 20 meters by 100 meters, there's four of them oriented north-south. The total collecting area here is about five hockey arenas. It's a very, very large structure. Um, and along the axis of each of these cylinders uh, are hanging 200, you can't quite see them, but are hanging 256 uh, antennas that are sensitive in the frequency range 400 to 800 megahertz. And all of those antennas are collected and put into a homegrown local, uh, local supercomputer that combines all of them together and allows the telescope to be sensitive to a huge area of the sky overhead. There's no moving parts, so it hap you, you can see only what's overhead, and that was just fine for cosmology because they wanted to map the whole northern sky and just let the Earth rotate through. And that's what, uh, that, that was an interesting project for studying dark energy. Uh, but it turned out that that same design would be really useful for studying 
fast radio bursts, which are transient events happening all over the sky. You can't predict where or when. You need a telescope that could see a huge area of the sky all at once. And so I led a proposal to add fast transient detection capability to CHIME. It wasn't originally designed to be able to detect short bursts of radio waves. It was designed to study um, uh, the distant hydrogen in the distant universe. Uh, but we began, we, we put it together and we began detecting fast radio bursts with CHIME in, in 2018. Um, and uh, by the way, just very recently, this has been uh, a very, very successful project. We have released our first catalog with over 500 fast radio bursts. That's many, um, a, a great leap forward for this, this, uh, the study of these objects. In fact, you could see this here. This is a, uh, a plot showing the number of fast radio bursts that were known. Um, that was the Lorimer burst found very early. And you can see the different telescopes, the different radio telescopes in the world that uh, detected them. The Parkes telescope that I showed you before detected a lot. And then uh, the Australian uh, SK Pathfinder telescope started finding them. When, when CHIME turned on, um, oops, when CHIME turned on, that's how this uh, uh, plot looks. Uh, we, we really, uh, we have a huge detection rate, and so we find so many more FRBs than, than um, conventional radio telescopes because of the very unusual design of the telescope, the cylindrical um, design. Uh, and then, so why am I telling you about fast radio bursts? I thought I had moved on from magnetars. I thought I had left the field of magnetars, but in fact, uh, no. So last year, uh, we made a major landmark discovery with the CHIME telescope, thinking we were only going to be detecting sources you know, at cosmological distances. We actually suddenly, it was in April of last year, not long after the, the lockdown, uh, the telescope detected one of the brightest fast radio bursts ever seen. In fact, probably the brightest. Uh, uh, but not from a cosmological distance, from within our own galaxy, a local fast radio burst and we I, were able to identify it with a known magnetar in our galaxy. So we detect soft gamma repeater 1935 plus 2154 emitted a massive radio burst. This, that had never been seen from a magnetar before. And that was incredibly exciting. It sort of brought these two worlds together because it strongly suggested by finding one in the galaxy that could emit such a bright burst, it suggests that perhaps some, or maybe all, we don't yet know, fast radio burst sources are being produced by distant magnetars throughout the universe. So uh, this was very exciting, and, and I like to think of magnetars as a gift that keeps on giving. We thought we'd I thought I had studied them uh, quite a bit, uh, and here, I, here they come back um, all over, the, just all over the universe. Um, and uh, this is the last slide's a little more technical for aficionados, but what I want to show is uh, this is a plot with distance now on the x-axis over many, many orders of magnitude. So this is inside our galaxy, and this is at the farthest reaches of the galaxy, uh, uh, sorry, of the, of the universe. Uh, this is, you know, roughly the edge of the galaxy. Here you're going way out to cosmological distances, and this is observed radio brightness of of uh, tr short radio transients that we know of. And these are all you know, radio pulsars that have emitted bright radio bursts. These are ones that are nearby, not, very, not particularly bright. These are all the fast radio bursts. They're depicted this way because there's large uncertainties on, on the measurements because they're, we don't really know the distances very well. Uh, but you can see um, that they're, because they're, even though they're so far away, they're at about approximately the same brightness. Um, these diagonal lines are lines of constant energy. So it shows you, he, and this is, by, this is factors of a thousand. So these sources are many, many orders of magnitude more luminous than the galactic radio pulsars. And this is a source that Chime discovered, and also another Caltech telescope, STAIR-2, discovered the SGR in our own galaxy at roughly the same energy range as the least energetic FRBs that we know of. That's what's telling us magnetars may be the solution to another problem, the fast radio burst problem. 
So in conclusion, um, I want to thank so many people for um, the research and the, the, the uh, support that I've been given over the years. I'm really grateful to my mentors and my colleagues who've played such a big role in um, all the magnetar work over, over the year. Here's a few. Very, I, I, there's so many people, I, I can't name them all, but these are some key people who really uh, were tremendous mentors and, and colleagues and, and, and helpful. Um, but I am even more grateful to the many students and postdocs who have worked in my research group over the years. Uh, you know, as a faculty member, you, you have so many responsibilities. You're teaching and your committee work and, and reviewing and all sorts of things. Uh, so it's the grad students really who um, had the, the pleasure of doing a lot of the, a lot of the nitty gritty work. And I'll, I'm forever grateful to them, particularly Fotis Gavril, Reem Deeb, Scott Olison. Uh, Pete Woods and many, many others. And I really want to dedicate this Shaw Prize to them because uh, they were such a big part of it over the years. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Hello, Professor Cavalotto, Professor Cosby. Hello. Hello. Uh, congratulations on the Shaw Prize. And I'm Hua Bai Li from CHK Physics. I will be hosting the Q&A session. So first I bring a couple of questions from my colleague, then I'll start to read you the question we received from the, uh, from the audience. Okay. I got one minute to introduce you before your lecture, which was a tough job for me because given the long list of your achievements and awards. So the, the first question is, um, does receiving the show prize feel anything different from those many other prizes you already received? Uh, whom do you address the question to? Uh, Professor Kevaluto. Okay. Uh, yeah, I believe this is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, one of maybe the biggest prize I've ever gotten. It's extremely important to me. Uh, it has a very, very large prestige and uh, I am very uh, grateful and appreciative of having received the prize. Okay, Professor Cosby. Uh, uh, yes, yes, it's a... It's a Tremendous honor. It is, it is the biggest prize I've ever received. I am um, shocked and, and uh, uh, humbled by the other prize recipients. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, it's just an absolute, uh, absolute thrill. Thank you so much. Okay. The second question is, now we learned all the splendid outcome from your career. Uh, I wonder, is there any uh, tough obstacles in the 30, 40 years in your career that you might be able to share with the younger scientists in the audience and maybe give them some hint uh, how to face the difficulties in case they encounter similar. Um, should I begin? Uh, yes, please. Yes, uh, there have been, I have to say, many obstacles. Um, first and all, first of all, when you're a physicist, it is, uh, you know, it requires a lot of work, a lot of dedication, many, many hours of concentration, quiet. Sometimes that means, you know, giving up things, uh, that other people do that you would love to do, like, you know, parties or, um, you know, movies, things that many people do. Uh, so it's an obstacle that you, 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 you some, there's some sacrifice that goes in if, if you really want to do this at the highest level. Um, other obstacles are also, uh, you know, I, I, I often struggled with confidence. Like, can I really do this? Is this really uh, for me? Uh, I, I don't struggle with that anymore, especially <laughs> with things like the Shaw Prize, that certainly helps. Um, and then of course, being female, I think that also in a very, uh, male dominated field, sometimes, uh, there's, um, the need to prove yourself, uh, to show, yes, I, I can do this, uh, to, to others. I've, I've definitely felt that way. And, uh, 
uh, uh, no longer, I don't, I, I don't feel that way anymore, but, uh, when I was younger, I did. And I guess my message to young people would be, uh, ignore all that, just go and do the work because there's so much wonderful work to do. And if you love doing it, that's all that really matters. Okay. Thank you. Professor Kovalilto. Uh, Professor Lee, would you mind repeating the question? Because the moment you asked it, the, a car alarm went off and I was running to see if it were my car. It was just next door. Sure, so of course. I couldn't hear the question. Okay, sorry. so the, the question is, uh, we learned all the great outcomes from your career. And is, we wonder, is there any difficulties that you have overcome during the 40 years of your career that you might be able to share with the younger generation of the scientists? Maybe give them a heads up and give them some hint how to overcome these difficulties. Um, yeah, where do I begin? Uh, I guess the first difficulty would be the fact that uh, uh, the original uh, PhD project I was supposed to do had to change because the uh, the expedition, the balloon expedition that was going to uh, host the instrument that I was going to use for my thesis uh, was not accepted in Australia because it was too big and the crane was not good enough for it to uh, release the balloon. So after about a year and a half or so of having studied uh, for this particular experiment, I had to start from scratch, which was a blessing in disguise, because I then turned entirely into the uh, gamma ray bursts, and that's where I did my thesis. Uh, I went to the United States to be trained in a different instrument, and basically I was, that's how I started my long-term relationship with the United States. Uh, in particular with NASA, uh, my first experience was with Goddard. So um, I guess uh, there is always a, a solution. There is always a path that you can actually deviate from the original path as long as you do not want to deviate from your absolute goal, which is astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, during my career, I had a lot of people I worked with and whom I respect. And I believe that they also do respect me. And uh, I have never encountered a particular person that did not consider me a colleague that he or she would want to work with uh, because of uh, the gender, because of the nationality or the origin of the nationality. Um, I think uh, and I probably, this is a selection criterion. I work with people that I like and I have made several collaborations and teams. In fact, the Heinemann Prize included uh, the ability to uh, foster large collaborations as part of the prize. Uh, but I treat everybody as a family. Uh, I treat everybody as uh, someone that I would like to work with and uh, interact with. I think that this says a lot for the colleagues that we're working with. Great, thank you so much. Okay, uh, now we have the questions from the audience coming. Uh, let me try to read. Um, the first one is to Professor Caspi. Uh, where were, were there any X-ray observations on the same star uh, during the FRB event last year? Uh, could there have been an X-ray burst uh, coinciding with the radio burst? Uh, that is a fantastic question. Thank you for that. Yes, the answer is yes. There were X-ray observations simultaneously when we detected the X-ray burst with CHIME. This was not just a coincidence, it was because the X-ray telescopes had been watching it. It had been undergoing an X-ray outburst. It was in the process of emitting many, many bursts. 
And so there were actually multiple X-ray telescopes uh, observing it, and they did detect a burst that was simul close to simultaneous, when I say close, within milliseconds of uh, the burst that we detected. And I think Chris actually probably has a few extra words to say about that <laughs> if, I, if I'm not, uh, I'm sure she would love to, but the answer is definitely yes. Yes, and this is published in our paper basically on 1935. And I showed that slide uh, in my talk. Uh, the important thing is uh, we work with SWIFT data, but there were other instruments like Integral that actually confirmed that this burst in particular was different from the bulk of the X-ray burst that this source emitted. It was harder. So uh, there is that very interesting difference and this very interesting difference. And uh, so far, we don't have another one, uh, but we are looking forward to uh, actually um, detect another simultaneous burst or contemporaneous, I would say, because this is not exactly simultaneous. And uh, that burst uh, made us now uh, have uh, actually uh, organized contemporaneous uh, observations between X-ray and, and uh, radio observatories, CHIME as well, right, and FAST in, the, in China. So basically, uh, so far we haven't identified another coincidence, but we're looking forward to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, I think it's can be can for both of you. Uh, does the neutron degenerate pressure have anything to do with the extreme event of magnetars? Okay. Professor uh, Cosby? Pre okay, so. go ahead. Oh, uh, so. Neutron degeneracy pressure is, uh, it certainly matters for keeping the neutron star from collapsing on itself due to the inward crushing pull of gravity. If it weren't for neutron degeneracy pressure, we wouldn't have neutron stars, we'd only have black holes. So in that sense, absolutely, it plays an important role. However, the bulk of the emission, the, uh, you know, the photons, the radiation that we detect from magnetars originates from the exterior of the star, from the magnetosphere, where magnetic fields are pl playing the biggest role in particle acceleration, in, in pr production of light and the explosions. So in that sense, the neutron degeneracy pressure is not very important anymore. It's the strength of the magnetic field that probably matters the most. Possibly the material strengths of the crust of the neutron star matter a lot as well. Um, in that case, the neutron degeneracy pressure is, is not as important. Professor Pivoliotto, you have any to add? Um, I just would like to add that the degeneracy pressure is what uh, prevents the, uh, the crust to actually expand outwards and therefore the uh, emission of bursts uh, are due to the crust of rotating and cracking, not expanding and cracking because the pressure is pretty strong. It keeps the crust at its place, but it allows it because of the very strong magnetic fields in the in inner part of the neutron star to rotate. So the crust breaks, but it breaks by twisting the crust, not by breaking the crust outwards. So the degeneracy pressure is keeping everything together, but it allows them to talk. So that's, um, that's just an addition to what Professor Cosby uh, just talked about. I agree with what you said. Um, so we see a few instruments that you show to make these discoveries. We see a, a receiver, I see one in the photo. Uh, we learned that the chime also made great discoveries. And I just heard from Professor Cavalotto about the FAST, the 500 meter telescope in, in Guizhou, China. So um, it's the size, the things uh, most matters for this kind of discovery. It's always a big telescope or what's the most important property of an instrument to make this kind of observation? Uh, Professor Cuspy? 
Yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. And, and the answer depends on what, what type of observation you want to make. So the FAST telescope is the largest aperture in the world, 500 meter aperture. And what that means in radio, for radio astronomy is tremendous sensitivity. So they can look at sources and detect very, very faint signals. On the other hand, their field of view, the amount of sky that they can see at any one time is pretty small. So for fast radio bursts, for example, they're not gonna discover many of them randomly because it's a transient phenomenon. They're happening all over the sky and they can only see a tiny fraction of the sky at any one time. Um, but Chime, on the other hand, has a huge, can see a huge area of the sky at any one time. So we can discover many, many fast radio bursts, even though we don't have the sensitivity of fast. So really to do the science, it's wonderful to have a radio telescope like Chime and FAST because Chime can find lots of sources and then FAST can focus in on them and, uh, and study them in great detail. And now in X-ray astronomy, it's, it's, it's different. Uh, you don't, you, they're satellites, so you can't uh, launch, you know, <laughs> 100 meter apertures like you can build on the ground. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, but there's other ways of, of uh, improving sensitivity and, and perhaps uh, Dr. Kovletu wants to uh, address that point. Well, we have different uh, uh, properties in different satellites. Some of them have the ability to collect a lot of X-ray photons. We call them buckets of photons. And this is XMM, for instance. Some of them, like Chandra, have a very high resolution uh, in, their, uh, in the instrument. So basically, they, we can uh, very accurately uh, locate the source. So it all depends on what the strength of its instrument is. Uh, and uh, we actually use many, several, and all starting from for finding uh, magnetars, in fact. Uh, we started from the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the burst and uh, transient source experiment. Uh, we went to the Fermi lab and, uh, and um, GBM, the Gamma Ray Burst Monitor. Uh, we had in the past the uh, BEPOSAX, RXTE. Uh, all of these uh, instruments have played a very, and of course, right now we have XMM, Chandra, and Swift, and Muster. Uh, so all of these experiments uh, played a very significant role com combined and to provide a, a very good uh, uh, collection of observations for every uh, source. Mm. Okay. The next question coming from the audience is very related questions. So I first read it. So uh, he said, I want to know how to find those signals in the best sky. How do you able to make sure those you observed is what you want? Um, we'll stop sure from, I yes. Can we I'm not sure I understand uh, the question. Can you repeat it? Mm. Is it... Uh... Okay, the question is, um, how to find signals from the vast sky? And how uh, can you make yeah. sure those you detect is what you want? Okay, uh, so uh, the person who is asking that probably has more experience with optical astronomy. In the X-rays and the gamma rays, a burst or a transient uh, source uh, does not come uh, in, in myriads per night. Uh, if you, for instance, are looking for a gamma ray burst, you probably will see one of them per night. And uh, in fact, uh, we discovered soft gamma ray peters while we were observing, looking for gamma ray bursts. The gamma ray burst transient sky is not like the optical, gamma, optical burst sky. You can see a lot of optical transients every night, but you will see only one gamma ray transient uh, in one night if you're lucky. Okay. Uh, Professor Caspi, anything to add to these questions? Um, well, act, so in radio astronomy, um, 
the story is a little bit different uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there are there's a lot of um, terrestrial, you know, human made uh, signals, everybody's cell phones and airplanes, and, and there's all sorts of uh, radio noise. And maybe that's what the uh, audience member was asking about, because in radio astronomy, it's a massive, huge challenge to identify what is actually cosmic and separate it out from what has been made by technology on the ground and for chime and, and i'm sure for fast and every radio telescope this is a, a huge problem that we struggle with every day i have students and postdocs who whose entire <laughs> large parts of their theses are are only about um algorithms for uh removing the terrestrial interference uh terrestrial noise sometimes using artificial intelligence algorithms. There, there's many, many ways to do it, um, but it's a continuing challenge and it's one that is getting worse with time because people <laughs> have more and more powerful cell phones and they want more bandwidth and there's lots, mm -hmm. just lots more radio noise. It's, it's a very, very big problem for radio astronomy. Mm -hmm. And for so, uh, once as a matter of fact, if I may say so, Professor, Lee, sure. because uh, we are now uh, trying to uh, uh, support dark and quiet skies, and there is a lot of work being done to make sure that uh, these interferences uh, are reduced or even uh, seized. Okay, thank you. Um, so one audience want to follow up the first questions. Uh, he or she asked that um, uh, for both of you, where were the, the were there any other frequencies of the EM spectrum or messengers like neutrino, gravitational waves that uh, can be observed from these sources? Mm. Professor Kivilotto, please. So we have observed in magnetars, uh, and that is collectively soft gamma repeaters and anomalous X-ray pulsars. We have observations in X-rays, gamma rays, infrared, and optical. Not all of them, uh, some of them, of course, radio as well. Uh, some of them actually have been observed in one or two wavelengths and some just in one wavelength, the X-rays. Uh, regarding neutrinos, uh, we have not detected any. We have not actually, uh, uh, we have collected information from the direction of bursts of all the, uh, of a very large sample of magnetar bursts, as I should say. And we have upper limits with uh, gravitational wave instruments. We believe that uh, the most likely uh, phenomenon that is associated with soft gamma repeaters or magnetars uh, would be one of the giant flares that could possibly have a companion gravitational wave. We only have seen three of them and we didn't have detectors at that time, gravitational wave detectors at that time. So we are hoping that there will be another one coming soon. And maybe that might be accompanied by a gravitational uh, wave trigger. Professor Caspi, anything to add? Uh, not really. I think Professor Kovalietu answered the question. Okay, good. Okay, next is the big questions. Uh, how do magnetic fields form in magnetars? Mm -hmm. Professor Caspi? <laughs> that's also that's a really wonderful you have a fantastic audience um very thoughtful people asking these questions so um we don't know for sure the answer to that question there are um hypotheses there's ideas uh one idea is that the is that the uh, magnetic field is a fossil magnetic field that is it's a remnant of the magnetic field that existed inside the massive star that imploded to produce the neutron star. 
there's some evidence that that might be true. Um, there's, it, it's very hard to know what the magnetic fields are in the cores of massive stars where the neutron star forms. We can measure magnetic fields at the photospheres on the outskirts of the stars and try and infer what it is on the inside, but that's actually very challenging to do. So we don't know that that's true. And in fact, um, many people would doubt that you could get the strength of the magnetic field and the magnetar from the, from the collapse. And um, Thompson and Duncan, who uh, both Chris and I referred to in our talks, two brilliant the uh, theorists uh, hypothesized in order to try and produce the magnetic uh, fields that a, a dynamo could, could operate, that the, when the neutron star is born uh, following the collapse, that um, if it's born spinning very, very rapidly, that any small magnetic field could get amplified by a, what's called the dynamo effect. Uh, and there, it's a beautiful theory, uh, there is, some are there are some arguments against that that being uh, correct um, in that if you, if you did form a magnetic field in that way then you would expect um, magnetars when they're very very young to emit a huge amount of um, uh, magnetic dipole radiation which should blow away any sort of supernova remnant that you find them in and yet we find magnetars inside supernova remnants so that's a bit of a puzzle in that uh, in that model, so so really the answer I would give is we're not uh, we're not sure we have ideas, um, but there's no perfect uh, model uh, uh, just yet. Professor um, Kubelotto, I agree with Professor Caspi. I would like to add though that there is one more ingredient that is in the model by Thompson and Duncan uh, regarding the dynamo, not only the fast rotation, but also the high convection rate, which basically is connect actually the motion that starts from the center and goes to the top and the material cools and then comes down. And it's actually at the same time rotating with a very high speed of rotation, takes the magnetic field lines that belonged to the original star that collapsed as Vicky just said, and bunches it together. So basically it becomes a very strong magnetic field inside the uh, neutron star. And therefore, uh, and it, but there is a limit. Uh, I think uh, if it reaches 10 to the 18 Gauss, the star will, the fall, will fall apart. It, won't, it cannot preserve magnetic fields of that order. So far, we have measured magnetic fields of 10 to the 14 Gauss. Uh, there are some very recent papers that report some much higher magnetic fields, 16 Gauss potentially as a limit. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very anxious to see whether this is gonna reach to the limit. Uh, as a matter of fact, of the, of, uh, the neutron star, the magnetar. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Uh, I really like the next question. Uh, the question is, uh, Megatop has been predicted and confirmed by observations from you. And uh, are those observations can feedback to let us learn more about the structures of magnetar or neutron star? Professor Caspi? Uh, absolutely. Uh, that, that is um, uh, uh, so much of the reason that um, people uh, like, like Chris and I and so many of the other um, fantastic magnetar astronomers in the world continue to study magnetars today. Um, there's so many different aspects of magnetar physics that we can study by looking at the phenomenology of magnetar outbursts, um, you know, the fact that when they have their outbursts, they turn on very rapidly within, you know, seconds, maybe hundred milliseconds, suddenly there's an outburst. Uh, and then there's a decay that can last weeks to months of those x-rays. Why weeks to months? That's an interesting time scale. What does that mean? Um, 
why do we, the burst rates, the distribution of burst rates can tell us about the, the surface on the neutron star, how it, how it cracks. Um, we can learn about the, the um, uh, currents in the, magnetic, in the magnetosphere, uh, how they're generated, um, do they scatter, um, what sort of processes happen in the magnetospheres, uh, how does the magnetosphere talk to the interior of the star? How does the, uh, um, the crust cracking um, then propagate into the magnetosphere? There's so much physics that, that we can learn. Um, upcoming soon, there's going to be a, an X-ray mission studying X-ray polarization, uh, something that's very, very hard to measure. And there is so much that we could learn, I think, from X-ray polarimetry. Um, there's so many predictions about the propagation of different um, polarization modes in, in the uh, atmospheres of, of magnetars and the magnetospheres of magnetars. I think that that, the, that mission is going to do fantastic science. It's gonna teach us a, a, an enormous amount. So, so the answer to your question is yes, there's huge amounts of physics that gets fed back into the theories by, by doing the observations. Was that people also? Um, yeah, I don't think I have a lot to add here. Uh, polarization is also very important, as Ricky said, and uh, experience is the next mission probably will help understanding the biorefringence of the vacuum if we can uh, through the polarimetry. But I might, uh, I, I'm waiting to see uh, the results of that mission. Okay, I understand. The next question is again about observation. The questions I'm going to just summarize is that uh, you kind of mentioned that first you can use a telescope with a very large field of view to find the signal and they can follow up with a very high resolution telescope to pinpoint the source. But how exactly is it being done? And also the audience add, how do you know the distance of the source? Professor Kuvelotto. So basically, uh, we use a method that the police is using when they're trying to find uh, uh, transmitters. Uh, basically, triangulation. You have one or two uh, satellites, and the uh, wavefront basically passes one and then the other. And if you have three satellites, you have a region that you triangulate. If you have two satellites, you have a ring. So this is how we find the actual uh, direction. If we do not have an imaging instrument like uh, Chandra that can give us a very detailed uh, location of the source. Uh, the distance is not uh, well known to most of these sources. Some of them we know that they belong to, well, we know they are in our galaxy, that's for sure. And we know that two of them are in the two satellite galaxies, the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. Um, we actually trying to measure the distance by calculating the absorption towards this direction. Uh, so we have very large limits uh, of ranges for the distances for these sources. Um, I also wanted to point out something else, which I now forgot, but uh, I think that's about, uh, that's about it. Okay. Professor Cuspy, anything to uh, add? Yes. Yeah, so um, it, it depends if the uh, audience member, when they ask the question, if they're referring uh, to X-ray astronomy or which for which um, Professor Kovalietu just answered um, very very nice very beautifully uh, or radio astronomy and um, it might have been radio astronomy because the, the 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 way the question was expressed sort of echoed something that I had said earlier about the difference between chime and fast so I guess I have to get a clarification um, if they meant radio astronomy or X-ray astronomy because the answers would be different. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Thank you for this. Okay, I understand. Um, the next questions, I, I think uh, uh, the audience really want to learn more about the question I asked from the very beginning. So uh, I think this is she, she said, uh, ask any more advice for early career lady physicists? Professor Cosby. 
Well, uh, I would say it, does, it, it should not matter yes. what your gender is. Um, <laughs> I believe that very strongly. If you love science and you're hardworking and you feel that passion and that drive where you really want to know the answer and you're willing to stay up until crazy hours at night uh, to figure it out, um, then you should do it and don't let anyone tell you that you can't. That is my advice. And that I, I feel comfortable giving you that advice because I wish I had been given that advice when I was younger. I wish I could tell my younger self that, uh, uh, because really there is so much fantastic work to be done and we need brilliant minds. And I don't believe there's any evidence, uh, scientific evidence that, uh, uh, the brilliance of the mind depends on the gender. I am so much in agreement with Professor Caspi. And that's what I tell my students. And that's what I tell my colleagues that gender doesn't matter. The brain works equally well in both types of genders or any type of gender for that matter. And uh, I think nobody should think that there is a deficit in brain matter if you're female or if you're not male. I mean, I, I would add one, one, if I may, may I, may I add one? Of course, one comment? please. Um, I, I think it's, we should not ignore that there are cultural influences and, you know, there's a world out there where there's many people and, and in different societies, there are places where women are told uh, and girls are told that, no, you can't do this. Uh, so it's important to to be aware of the environment and the culture that 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 one is in, and to adjust uh, accordingly, and and to have firm in your mind if you if you love to do something, but um, also to, um, uh, to to appreciate the challenges that you you might face, mm -hmm. and uh, in some places it might be easier to do it uh, than others. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to um, belittle or not, not belittle, but uh, uh, not fully appreciate the challenges that exist for women in, in many, many parts of the world. Uh, that's absolutely true. And uh, all I can say is that I, I think in an ideal world, uh, it, it, then, then there would be no barriers to, to women doing any, uh, anything um, they want. Thank you so much for the advice. Uh, given the time, we can only receive one more questions. And I think this one is really good for the conclusion for today. Uh, the question is, what do you think will be the next breakthrough in this field of magnetar? Hmm. Professor Kugelotto, please. So we have so far found a set of magnetars that have properties that are pretty similar. Uh, the range of magnetic fields like 10 to the 14, maybe 10 to the 15. I'm still waiting to see uh, magnetars that have different spin periods, uh, different magnetic fields, higher magnetic fields. And recently we actually have found uh, very uh, slow magnetars, so to speak, of the order of minutes, uh, spin periods, which is very uh, unusual. Uh, so uh, when I say we, I do not mean myself. Other colleagues have actually worked on that. So basically, uh, this is something that's probably coming up. Uh, but there is one thing that from the very first time that we actually decided that these are indeed sources with extreme magnetic fields, magnetars, the question that came up from other members of the community was, no, this is not really magnetic fields that are inherent to the source, but they're probably also 
uh, critting sources, which meant that these were binary sources. We have not yet been able to actually find any magnetar that is part of a binary system. I would be very curious to see if in the future uh, we find that uh, a piece of the puzzle, if it is part of the same puzzle we're working right now. Uh, so I'm very, uh, I, I, I'm still hunting for this elusive binary, which I haven't been able to identify in a magnetar, which I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine with not finding it. Professor Cuspy. Uh, I can think of two, two possible breakthroughs. So certainly what Professor Kovliotu says is, is uh, you know, absolutely true and I uh, agree with. Uh, the two that I would say, I, again, I think this uh, new NASA mission IXPE that's going to launch and do X-ray polarimetry could really rev be, be wonderful now, it, you know, for, for magnetar uh, physics. If we can detect X-ray polarization, it will be a, a, a direct concrete signature. Um, uh, if we, if, if, if magnetars are predicted to be extremely highly polarized in X-rays, something that has not yet been observed. If that, if that is observed, that will be one of the most direct, uh, uh, even, if, if, even more direct than the spin down arguments that we presented in our talks earlier uh, for the very high magnetic fields, arguably, arguably perhaps Chris and I would, would, would debate this, but I, I think that would be fantastic. That's number one. Number two, I think, um, you know, we found one fast radio burst in our galaxy that has emitted a burst that was, was very, very luminous, but still nowhere near as luminous mm -hmm. as you need for all fast radio bursts to be uh, understood as magnetars. We, the fast radio bursts that we detect in the universe are, 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 some of them are very, very distant and are six to nine orders of magnitude more luminous than the magnetar we detected in our galaxy with Chime. So if Chime were to detect a much more luminous burst from a galactic magnetar, well, that would prove that a, a whole lot of fast radio bursts uh, could be magnetars. I think that could be a, a, a big breakthrough in the field because first of all, we'd see the magnetars can make such powerful radio waves, but also it would prove this whole class of objects uh, could be magnetars. I okay, just thank to you. Add one thing here uh, yes, uh, to what Vicky just said that uh, unfortunately, while we can see the fast radio bursts, the detection of the X rays associated potentially with the extra galactic radio bursts are not going very far out from the distances that these fast radio bursts are coming. We can see a giant flare that we actually have detected in our own galaxy at most up to about 400 to 280 kiloparsec, which is a very nearby distance to our galaxy. And all these fast radio bursts are coming from much longer distances. So uh, it's mostly from our own galaxy, as Vicky said, that we stand a chance to detect the coincidence, another coincidence between the fast radio burst and an X-ray burst. Understand. Okay, Professor Kivaloto. Professor Cosby, thank you so much for the lectures and uh, particularly the very inspirational Q&A session. So I enjoyed it so much. And uh, congratulations again on your well-deserved prize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, professors. Uh, this is the end of the lecture. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye. <laughs>